Hello, and welcome to the Times Higher Education webinar, Strengthening Institutional Open Research Ecosystems with Repositories, held in partnership with Digital Science. My name is Sritu. I'm the Deputy Editor for Branded Content at Times Higher Education. Research infrastructure is an important part of the ongoing digitalization in the higher education sector, which helps to enhance data management, accessibility, and collaborative research. In this webinar, we're going to talk about the role of repositories in maximizing the value of open research infrastructure and how institutions can gain enhanced reporting capabilities through interconnectivity and integrations. We'll also talk about how reliable open research infrastructure can help institutions adhere to the FAIR principles in their research management. But we'll also talk about what challenges institutions face in doing this. We have a great panel of experts joining us today. I will now invite them to introduce themselves. Andrew, would you like to go first? Hello, I'm Andrew Stewart. I'm Professor of Cognitive Science, Institutional Lead for Open and Reproducible Research and Head of the Department of Computer Science here at the University of Manchester. Thank you. Claire Nolds. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Knowles and I'm the Associate Library Director for Research and Digital Futures at the University of Leeds Libraries. I'm also the sponsor for the White Rose Libraries at Leeds. We do our institutional repositories with York and Sheffield Universities and I've had the pleasure of being the chair of the Open Repositories Conference and stood down from that last year. Thank you, Claire. Claire Turner, please. Yeah, second Claire uh, of the, the session. Um, my name is Claire Turner. I'm the SVP of Commercial for Digital Sciences Research Workflow Solutions. So that includes things like Figshare, uh, our repository platform, and Synthetic Elements and Synthetic Grant Tracker, which are research information management systems and grant uh, tracking systems as well. Thank you, Claire. James? Hi, I'm James Wilson. I'm the Head of Research Data Services at University College London, um, which is part of the Advanced Research Computing Department. Uh, I'm also Head of Profession for Data Stewardship at UCL. Thank you, James. Uh, and finally, Mark. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Hannell. I'm the founder of Figshare, which is a repository platform, and now the VP of Open Research at Digital Science. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Before we begin, I would like to point out that this webinar is being recorded and we'll share the on-demand video with all the participants shortly after the webinar. If you have participated in TSU webinars in the past, you will notice that we're following a different format this time. Our panelists will do a brief presentation first and then we'll move on to a panel discussion. We'll be taking questions from the audience towards the end of our discussion. So please use the Q&A function to post any questions you have and we'll try to get to all of your questions. Once again, thank you all for joining and I'm excited to have you all with us today. I will now hand over to Mark from Digital Science to start our presentations today. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Sritu. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. I am just taking the first five minutes to, to set the scene, maybe plant a few ideas. I'm very enthusiastic about the role of repositories in the academic infrastructure. There's so much opportunity. They've been around for a while. Is there missed opportunity? Has that ship sailed? Um, I'm optimistic, so I'd, I'd say that the ship hasn't sailed. Um, just a, a little bit about my credentials on this, as I mentioned. So we're part. I started Figshare, which is part of the digital science family back in 2011. So over a decade now, we've been trying to build repositories that fill that gap. And a lot has changed in the, the last decade when it comes to open research and open academic uh, platforms and dissemination. Uh, this is some data I just pulled from our sister organization dimensions. And you can see it's fantastic that we now see more open uh, uh, access publishing than we see closed access publishing every year. And um, the interesting part about that is that the if you go back to 2010, 2011, green open access and gold open access were on a level playing field. And now we see gold has accelerated at such a rate. So paying for open access as opposed to the green route of putting a copy in your uh institutional repository or any other repository has grown it's doing well but not at the same rate and i think that's that's a challenge that we should try and address um i like to think about different what optimal academic publishing means 
And for me, it's fast, open, cost-effective, and trusted. The most important thing for me there is trusted. If you don't have trust, then the other things are less relevant. Hence with preprints, which is fast, open, and cost-effective, but it doesn't have that peer review. It's not trusted. Um, it's, it's great, but it's not perfect. And so with green open access pu publishing that isn't fast, but it is open, cost-effective, and trusted, um, I think there's a, a brilliant way to fill that gap of uh, focusing attention on innovation in making green open access more effective and easier for the researchers to comply with to get towards this Shangri-La of open academic publishing. Now, if we go back to those uh, uh, that some of that data on academic publishing from before, you will see that the number of academic publishing outputs coming out of uh, universities globally is growing. Uh, we know that papers are growing, but you'll also see that the amount of data sets is growing as well. So this is a new thing. There's, there's, if you actually look at this graph on the right here, you can see that uh, there's about 2 million data sets published every year now, which is about the same amount of papers as there were in the year 2000. So I think when we talk about trust, when we talk about um, some level of checking of these files, I think that's a very important thing that publishers may struggle to deal with. And it, we're now in a time where academic institutions can control the dissemination of content in a way that uh, previously the, 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 uh, the publications world has a lot more ingrained uh, perverse incentives set in that data sets doesn't have. And I think there's a big opportunity in data sets. We do a state of open data survey every year um, at Figshare where we look at what researchers' attitudes are towards open data specifically. And we do find that year on year, uh, they have trouble with copyright. They are increasingly finding uh, not finding the time to manage their data. And they don't always understand the data management policies. Again, this is where I think institutions could play a huge role. But again, it requires funding. It's, uh, it's not an easy fix. If you look at where researchers say they go to for help with uh, making their data openly available, uh, a large proportion say the institutional library and or the research office. Some of them rely on the publisher. This is often because the, the, the point of expertise that they go to, the disseminator of their content already is the publisher. So I think that's a, an interesting um, angle for this conversation is the difference between who is seen as the expert in dissemination of content in the academic space. Um, and so some of my thoughts just on, on what can be done if you are working in the institutional library setting, particularly around data, you can offer clear guidance on things researchers are concerned about. So some of the things I just mentioned there, licensing, how to publish data, the uh, embargo periods and what have you that can be applied. Um, you can create resources on how to share the research, not just where to share it. Don't just tell them, put it here. We've got an institutional data repository. You've got to hold their hand with this. And at the final point, do accept data in your institutional repository because it does reduce barriers for researchers um, who are looking for solutions in this space. And I just wanted to finish off again with the scene setting with uh, getting a little bit zeitgeisty because I think, um, you know, there is a lot of academic content that's being published. We do need it to be trustworthy. There is this uh, post-COVID, post-truth world, people interpreting things in how in ways they want to be interpreted. So the university repository being a support source of information, it does need to have checks and balances to make sure that we're getting out the right stuff and the right version of record. Um, we do know that this isn't a problem for institutional repositories on their own per se, academic publishers are, are finding um, issues within the um, scholarly literature. And on the left-hand side here is just one of the many examples where we're highlighting a problem in a paper mill problem. Um, and on the right-hand side here is some trust markers from digital science that look at ways in which we can automatically try and see is a paper trustworthy. What I want to say about this is the good thing about the graph on the left is we know that it exists. The a worst thing is that we don't know there's problems in the academic literature. And so knowing that it exists means that we can correct. And I think at a time where content coming out of universities is gonna be used more and more for 
uh, machines to consume, whether it's consuming the, the full text of the articles from the green open access, or whether it's the consuming the data. We've just seen the launch of AlphaFold 3 from DeepMind changing the scholarly landscape. So I did think it was it's worth just mentioning. Um, I think there's a lot of innovation that can happen at the institutional repository with non-human uh, bots that come and try and clean the content as we go. Um, and I think it's a balance right now of, of what comes first. Are the machines going to clean, curate and clean the academic content before the machines come and take it as fact and build new knowledge from it? Or is it vice versa? I think it's going to be a balance of somewhere in the middle, but hopefully that whets your whistle for what's about to come. And I will pause here and pass on to my colleagues. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mark. Hopefully, uh, this is sharing okay and I. Um, so, just want to start really by saying that uh, open research is is a real priority for us uh, here at the University of Manchester. I work closely with our uh, vice president for research and also uh, with our office for open research. Uh, really, have, having the conversations around uh, what open research means um, for different disciplines, because I'm very aware that there isn't uh, a one-size-fits-all uh, policy in terms of open research and, and how we might capture open research activities using uh, a variety of uh, repositories. So I guess it's maybe worth starting by thinking, well, what do we mean by the various open research indicators and practices that we might want to capture uh, using the repositories available to us. And I think there's quite a clear overlap between those open research practices and the indicators of responsible research practices. Um, and these you know, basically map onto just about every stage of the research life cycle, right from uh, you know, the things that you might do before you conduct research, uh, the various activities associated with conducting the research itself, and then reporting of those activities. Um, and we can look at these Hong Kong principles for assessing researchers uh, and kind of break each of these stages down into a number of subcomponents. And I suspect there are probably other aspects of open research that, that aren't even present, even, even in this uh, quite detailed uh, chart here. Um, my particular interests um, are in terms of the computational reproducibility side of things. In one of my previous roles uh, here at the university, I was um, in charge of the UA4 return for REF. So I think I'm the first panelist to mention REF uh, on this call today. So, so REF is also something that's very much uh, informing my perspective on these sorts of things. Um, so for actually to look, look in at the, um, at the various uh, activities around sharing of data, sharing of code, we can actually drill down a little bit further, which I think then further uh, indicates uh, some of the some of the issues that we're kind of facing in terms of capturing these activities via repositories. Um, I always like going back to this great paper by Roger Pang. It came out a number of years ago. We talked about all the things you need, all the components that you need, that you need to capture in order for research to be truly uh, computationally reproducible. So on one end of the extreme over here, we've just got the output. Um, but then we can provide the analysis code that was used to generate results alongside the data. Uh, and a lot of people are already doing this, and that's great. But one thing that's really important as well is making sure that the analysis code is executable. Um, we all know that you know software that we use changes over time. Libra libraries get updated. Uh, versions of the software get updated too. And code that might have worked you know, a year or two on my own machine with you know, the versions of the software I was using then might not actually work now. So we need, be, need to be able to capture uh, the code in an executable form. So we need to also capture something uh, to do with the computational environment. Um, slightly more recent paper breaks, again, some of the aspects of this down even further into the uh, components that we might want to consider in terms of the code itself, uh, such as literate programming, making sure the code is as readable by humans as it is by computers. Uh, appropriate version control and persistent sharing. Uh, very often a paper will come out, uh, you know, linked to a particular uh, sort of analysis code that might be on a repository somewhere. And, and what might happen over time is that actually an, that actual analysis code on the repository gets kind of updated. So after a while, the version on the repository isn't necessarily the same version that was used in the paper. So we kind of need to capture that uh, via, via version control. Um, 
It's interesting when you look at the range of repositories available. Uh, this uh, website, the Invest in Open Infrastructure website, attempted to capture all the different repositories that are out there that colleagues are using. And what I find is that different uh, researchers have their own preferred way of you know, doing open and reproducible research. They'll use some repositories maybe more than others in particular disciplines. Uh, and a very sort of cursed research suggests there are at least 57 solutions out there of repositories that, that people might be using. And I think this is probably a significant underestimate just from uh, my awareness of the variety of uh, tools and repositories used uh, around the University of Manchester. So a lot of people are engaged in open research, but they're not doing it in the same sort of way. They're using you know, different repositories for different stages of the research life cycle. And somehow we have to kind of, you know, capture all of those different repositories together to get an understanding for a particular research output, you know, where the data is stored, where the code is stored, uh, you know, whether there's pre-registration material as well. So what I thought I would uh, really end with is really a number of challenges that I sort of been uh, sort of thinking about over the past year or two in conjunction with our VP for Research and our Office for Open Research. So at one level, um, I want to see that uh, engagement with open research practices uh, using uh, repositories is something that's on a upward trajectory at the University of Manchester. So how do we generate those kind of reports given that each academic might be actually using a different a different subset of repositories to host their data code uh, and other research objects? Uh, this is important for us as an institution to understand uh, how we're making progress and whether progress is uh, similar in all disciplines. Um, but you know, thinking from a ref perspective, again, is probably also going to be important in terms of ref reporting. Um, it was great seeing Mark's slide with the sort of increase in open access publications over the last number of years. And I think ref had a big part to play in terms of uh, academics within the UK engaging with open uh, open access public publishing uh, in order for their papers to be to be ref ref compliant. Um, a real challenge from my perspective is really understanding how we connect papers, data sets, and executable code together. Um, you know, papers might be on Figshare or another repository. Uh, data, data sets might be somewhere else. Uh, if you've got, you know, neuro, neuroimaging uh, data, that could be on one of the specialist uh, uh, data set repositories, which holds uh, large data sets and executable code. Probably going to be on GitHub, but not necessarily. And I think the, the use of GitHub uh, across disciplines is really interesting because it's you know, increased massively over the last few years. So given the prevalence of GitHub, how do we ensure that the code on a particular GitHub repository is persistent and linked with the outputs that use it? Um, some of you on the call may be familiar with the Journal of Open Source Software. Uh, they've got a really nice model where uh, a paper will have a GitHub repository associated with the paper and the code. And when the paper is published, uh, the, the code repository will be tagged with a version release, and that will generate uh, a DOI that's then linked, linked to the output. So that's one nice way, I think, of how we can kind of capture uh, you, you know, the appropriate version um, code associated with particular output. Um, and again, this is, this is a, a behavior change question, really, at the end. Um, Academics are under a lot of pressure. It does take time to, uh, you know, engage in open research practices. It takes time maybe to change the way you've, you've been doing things, uh, you know, over, over a number of years. So how do we direct colleagues towards the appropriate repositories uh, for, for, you know, to be used in their discipline uh, in a manner that's going to be easier, easier for them uh, and, you know, will have a sort of low, low barrier um, associated with to really help them facilitate to do that. So these are these are the questions I'm kind of finishing with. I don't really have any answers, unfortunately, but I'd be really interested in in in, in hearing answers from uh, people on the panel and also from the room if you've got any thoughts about these when we get onto the discussion later. So that's it from me. I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, pass you over now, I believe, to James. Good afternoon. Let me just see if I can share my slides. Hopefully. That is now being shared. Oh, no, I don't think it will be. Hopefully that is now being shared and you can all see that on your screen. Um, so I am James Wilson. Uh, I am very much focused on the data side of things. So I'm the head of the research data services in UCL. We have other teams who manage the uh, institutional repository for um, 
the more traditional kind of outputs, the papers, the journal articles, uh, monographs, and so forth. Uh, but I deal with the data, um, not just the research data repository. We use Figshare as our research data repository, but also other services that form part of this data ecosystem that we're going to be um, talking about. So uh, I'm also in charge of the research data storage service, which is a very large multi-petabyte uh, data storage service for data in the in the kind of the live period of a project in practice uh, we do actually keep data beyond that and we're installing a proper archive at the moment where we can move data to once it's no longer in use um, but which hasn't been published do try and encourage that data is published uh, and made as open as possible but sometimes it needs to be as closed as necessary as you may have heard uh, I also uh, manage an electronic research notebook service, which is based on the uh, technology R space. And I am now the proud manager of a, a team of about 15 uh, data stewards, who we might talk a little bit about later. But I'm going to focus this brief introduction on a rather naive uh, looking um, research data lifecycle model, um, because although it's naive and doesn't really capture all the complexities of research and the generation and publication of data, it does illustrate the kind of ecosystem uh, that we're dealing with. And one of the key things to note about this ecosystem is that as uh, an institutionally based service provider, there are relatively few points at which we can really influence the behavior and activities of our researchers. So we will help them with a data management plan, we will help them cost projects, there's relatively little we can do to steer them when it comes to data collection. We offer data storage, however, it's one storage option amongst a great many, and we can't force our researchers to use the institutional one, much as we would like to, and as much as we encourage them. Um, data needs to be prepared and processed before it can be analyzed. Again, it's a slightly different team, although within my department that manage our high performance computing facilities, and which are increasingly uh, new uh, scientific outcome is derived. And it's relatively late in the day where people come to publish their data as a general rule. I mean, hopefully this slide also illustrates the importance of um, research uh, repositories in that they play such a big role in enabling people, people to catalog data, uh, find data in the future and reuse it, which is vital. Um, but it's a relatively late point. Now, often we find when people deposit data in our institutional instance of Figshare, we get a description that they had, which is something like along the lines of, this is the data that goes with the journal article we've published here, which isn't great because what we would like to do is really turn data into a first class research output in its own right, which can be reused, recombined with other data sets and inspire the generation of new knowledge combined with all sorts of instances with software as well. We need to capture all this information. But um, as Mark has already mentioned, researchers are usually pretty uh, short of time and they don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time doing something which many see as a little bit of a chore, uh, just being demanded from their funding agencies. We do have uh, processes to review metadata records as, we, as they are uh, developed. So our librarians will happily write back to the professors and whoever's submitted this and say, could you perhaps Provide us with a little bit more contextual information about the data you've generated. Uh, describing it in a way will make it findable for others, add some keywords and all of these kind of useful things. And usually our researchers are very nice and they do exactly that. However, this only really presents a kind of a point in time interpretation of the data that they've got at the point in which they're publishing. And data has an upbringing. Um, it also goes on and has a career after it's been published as well. But the upbringing is important because it tells us the story, provides the provenance of how the information was gathered, collected, uh, adapted, edited, used, transformed, all of these important things that enable people to have trust in that data when they're looking to reuse it and recombine it to make uh, new research, to create new research. Our researchers don't necessarily want to go to great lengths to describe in 12 paragraphs all of these processes. So what we're looking to do is try and join up the parts of the ecosystem that we can uh, to automate as far as possible the story of the upbringing of the data, the process it's been through, where it's got to so far. So they actually can be reused. It can have impact 
and this is where we need to track the the post publication story of the data as well to measure the impact it's had not just on academic articles or other data sets, but it's societal impact. We need to be able to capture this rich set of information, um, both pre and post publication about what's happened to data. We're taking steps along that path. We're trying to introduce things. One of the rationales for us uh, employing a substantial team of data stewards is that they can actually collaborate with research projects and help the researchers capture all the information um, the workflows, the processes as that's done. So they can actually become embedded in research teams and get that information and capture it so that when it is published, we have all that additional information. There are other challenges that we face. So at the moment, the institutional repository, we do encourage people to use specialist repositories where available. Uh, the institutional repository, we don't capture much in the way of uh, subject specific, community based metadata using those community standards developed uh, at great length amongst a number of disciplines. Being able to capture that data that's relevant to the people who are going to be reusing that data would also be a great way of encouraging uh, reuse in the future. Um, so it's a journey we're starting down. I mean, things like the Electronic Research Notebook, we're doing that to get a little bit of information about how the data has actually been collected, not used across all disciplines, but it does give us a little bit of that information that we need to automate things and enrich the metadata. So our challenge really is um, doing more of it in a complex ecosystem, how we bring all of these things together, how we can minimize the amount of effort that the researchers themselves need to put in uh, whilst improving the impact and the reuse value of that data and indeed all the associated outputs, the software, the papers and everything else. And I will leave that there. Um, so I think it's uh, time for me to pass on to Claire Knowles, I think is first up. Let me stop sharing. Thank you. Yes. Why is it you can never find the share button, even though it's bright green? Yeah. No, sorry. Okay. There we go. Hi, everyone. And as uh, sort of echoing others, open research is one of the key pillars here at the University of Leeds and one of the four for our research culture strategy. And repositories are a key component in the infrastructure that enable this. And I'll tell you a bit more about the repositories we have here at Leeds. So we have lots of repositories at Leeds. As I mentioned earlier, we have a number of them with our White Rose partners and they are our thesis repository, which is called Row. It's a silent W you see there in the brackets, and our research outputs, um, Row. So Rio and Row. And Row was launched in 2024, so it's its, I know, 20, 2004, sorry, so it's its 20th anniversary this year. We also have three repositories for our research data. We have an open data repository, one for restricted access. So this is um, data that's been anonymized, et cetera. It's not really um, commercially sensitive or patient data or anything that's completely separate, but this is um, data that needs access controls around it. And we also host a repository for called the Timescapes Archive, which is for qualitative longitudinal data. And that's not only Leeds data, um, other researchers from elsewhere in the UK can put their data there. We also have two repositories which are behind our special collections content within the library. And that is again, um, separated between two, one for open content and one for restricted content um, for data that people need to access here at Leeds. And why do our repositories matter? They matter in many ways, some of which are repeating my previous speakers. So one is discovery. It's the shop window of how people can find the content and the research outputs created here at the University of Leeds. Also our data and our collections. But lots of people don't come directly to the repositories. It's key that they work really well with search engines, our library management systems and our aggregators such as UK Core, Ethos for theses and other um, aggregate or services. It is also a trusted, sorry, um, repository where people can know that once they find them there, it's gone through our um, controls. It's a place for collaboration where you'll find things and then be able to collaborate with others or link things together. 
It is a place for impact. It helps us looking at what's been used in our repositories, where they've been cited, to look at the impact of the research and what it, how it impacts society. Going back to, and again to a previous speaker, it's key for reproducibility, especially when it's got those connections to the data, um, as mentioned previously. How far we go from the outputs to the data, to the research data, to the software, to the sources that they used at the beginning, those connections help improve the reproducibility of research. It's key for us within the university for reporting what's gone through. How many of our outputs are there? How many of them are green and gold and those other flavors of open access that we all know about? It helps give us insights, particularly when the data then comes through to databases such as Dimensions and Scopus. What sort of research are we doing at the University of Leeds? What are the trends? What are the patterns? Connecting that to research grants and collaborations. Um, yeah, once again, back to REF, it helps us with our funder compliance, making sure that our outputs are available and we're hitting those targets set to us through UKRI and Research England in those policies. It is also key for preservation. These are articles and outputs that we need to keep, we look after, and we want to preserve them for the long term so future generations can access the research that's being produced now and in the past and in the future. So where are we? In those 20 years that we've had a repository here at Leeds and 24 years since ePrints was released, we've done lots to take forward open access, as you can see, from the graph that Mark showed at the beginning. We've got established software that's looked after and part of our ecosystems in our libraries and the repository community has developed and pushed forward standards that make it lots easier for content to be found and reused and brought into aggregator services. It's not just sat here in the institution, but sort of echoing again my previous speakers, it's not for all our outputs to not necessarily make their ways into our repositories, nor should they, but they should be linked to them. This is particularly true of practice researchers and going back to the diagram with all those steps, how do we get those in our repositories and not just the outputs at the very end? Also, how do we move our repositories forward to make use of new technologies, make them cloud native, make them be able to use AI, which I know is another hot topic, bring in automation, enable it to be really easy to find and discover, not only for those going into Google and typing. And how do we make them interoperable so it is a full ecosystem, both in one institution, but nationally and internationally? Thank you. Lovely. Well, I think that's a, I, I'm glad I've gone last. I think everyone has set me up nicely to talk about my last, uh, last few set of slides. So I will share my screen, we will get going, and then I think we're moving on to the Q&A afterwards. Um, so uh, actually, Claire's previous point about the the history of, of how kind of long some of the code bases and uh, types of platforms that repositories are, are run on uh, have been around is a, a really theme for my talk here. Um, you might have been running a repository at your university for years or, or moved moved universities and inherited a you know a different type of platform to run it on um and most universities go through and, and research institutions will go through a standard it kind of cycle of evaluating our laptop still fit for purpose is the hardware that people use in, in the university still relevant um might not even just be software uh, uh andrew and claire pointed out that they have the same chair supplier clearly for their universities so you know universities as public bodies are reviewing regularly uh what they've got how it works um and this is my uh take home my call to action for any kind of repository librarians on the call today is to think about how ready is your repository at your university or repositories which is um very much commonplace and that there isn't really one repository platform that can necessarily do it all uh, how ready is yours to support open research and, and particularly again today about open data? So I think this is mentioned a couple of times but I will I will take some time to define what we mean by fair. Um, so Figshare is uh, 13, 14 years old soon and fair has been around probably about 10 years. So we, we kind of uh, actually, Mark, we, Mark built Figshare before uh, there were even community standards 
because as, as Claire said that you know, these actually come from the community and it's been decided um, quite worldwide now what we really want to be uh, aspiring to when we're thinking about how we share research outputs especially in repositories so the, the F stands for findable and we really want outputs to be as uh, open as possible and as close as necessary, which is what James said. So I've, I've written that down. Um, we've got accessible. Uh, ideally, outputs should never be behind a paywall. And if they are, there needs to be you know other ways in which you can get access to that content um, and at least the robust metadata for that content. Um, interoperable in a in a world where repositories are really considered part of the the tech landscape, you know the tech stack of what uh, a university and, and researchers need to use. We need to make sure that, that that software is able to play well with other softwares um, in the ecosystem of both administration within a university for reporting, but also for researchers. As Andrew was saying earlier about you know we need to meet researchers where they are. Coders use GitHub. That's not going to be a surprise to anybody, but GitHub doesn't mint a, a PID. So we need to find ways that we can really work together to to create some synergy between the systems. Uh, Mark, this is I think a, a Mark quote. Uh, identifies for everything. We need a PID for for as much as we you know can possibly uh, assign. It's going to make it so much easier for us in uh, administration type roles and worlds to to work with that data and make it more interoperable and, and reusable. Um, yeah, and reusable is really the end part. So a lot of this work is you know defined and provided by administrators uh, and people in library and kind of research supporting roles. But the idea is for the researchers themselves to benefit from all this work. They need to be able to use this data, as James was saying, to, to ideally create new insights from existing data that's already been uh, produced and, and paid for. So this is quite an old slide that I've had for a while. Um, and it used to be the way I talked about uh, how repositories are, are modernizing. Um, and this is categorized by normal repository functionality. So metadata, workflows, uh, content adaptability, and some interoperability. So some of these things are, you know, are quite aligned with FAIR. Um, but this is the, the kind of features that you might be thinking about. Does my repository meet all of these different needs against these criteria? And it was only for this presentation, you know, I was thinking about FAIR. Uh, and actually, if we started to color code some of these requirements instead of just being um, against normal repository features you look for when you're renewing or, or procuring repository software uh, or building it uh, in a lot of people's cases you uh, might be looking at workflows and metadata but actually what parts of these features in, in the software that repositories run on are really tied to FAIR uh, and how can we start to think about whether the software we have can support FAIR workflows. Um, I said to Mark earlier it's just very lovely for me that Figshare has uh, four colors in its logo and FAIR has four letters. So I have color coded them using the Figshare logo colors to represent different parts of FAIR. Um, but actually, if we then tried to make that a little bit more usable and a bit less, it's pretty, but not particularly easy to follow, uh, I made it into a, a mini checklist. So uh, very rudimentary. Um, but if we actually categorize these the repository type of outputs, uh, sorry, features uh, that support outputs into uh, into fair based columns, and then you could go home and, and think about what you've got and, and tick off or score yourself out of, uh, you know, how many of these features does your repository platform really support? Um, and there are, you know, plenty of repositories, that, as Claire said, that have been really pushing things forward staying relevant. Um, not all platforms make it in an open source or, or vendor based world. You know, things come in and out of flavor. Uh, but really kind of, I would suggest for sustainability, thinking about what repository platforms are aligned with this, because if you're looking to create fair outputs, you're going to want to you know leverage and, and use software that's going to support you with that in the long term. Um, so yeah, I've just kind of, I'll, we'll obviously share these slides, I think through, uh, through THE and I might even Make this a bit prettier and put it on Vigshare, but it could be a, a useful community resource because I would love actually the community to add or change, this is my opinion, on what features fit into what category of fair. Uh, and there's lots of different ones here that could have spanned multiple or might be in the wrong column. Um, and these are just, you know, I'm, I'm not a librarian, even though I've been supporting libraries for a good few years now. Uh, so I'm, I'd be very keen to hear if uh, people have additional ways in which they would like to, to evaluate repositories for fair. Um, I think my very last slide, is something that was already touched on many times today. Uh, Claire particularly was talking about this. Uh, repositories used to be somewhere that you put things and they lived there and they lived there in a 
maybe a more traditional library sense of being a, a place to preserve some outputs and some things. Um, so we're looking for repositories to be less as outposts and more as the building blocks, the infrastructure for those outputs to be shared between systems uh, for reporting, for tracking impact and actually for being used for, for enhancing research. And I think, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Claire. And thank you to our panelists for the wonderful presentations. A reminder for our audience members, if you have any questions about the presentations that you've just seen, do post your questions using the Q&A function. We have about 20 minutes left in our discussion, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, we have touched on the benefits of repositories a few times so far, and I want to explore this further. Can we talk about the role of repositories in maximizing the value of open research infrastructure? And an additional question there is, um, why is having a clear picture of open research uh, at your institution important? Um, can I come to you, Claire Turner, on this? You can, but I don't represent the universities. So I don't know, uh, does one of the university panelists want to take it? For the first point why is it important for you i think some of you touched on it but maybe reiterating why it's important for you to have that institutional lens for your outputs could i, I also ask add a little bit to it as well i'd be really interested to know you know there's open policies and then we've heard a little bit about the ref and ticking boxes and how much of it do you think is internally driven by the box ticking exercises or the I call them box ticking exercises, but they're important exercises because it affects university funding and all of these things. But how much of it is driven by administrative making sure everything's OK and how much of it is driven by the the institution's drive for having an open ecosystem and getting more impact for their research and but drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak? If I could maybe pick up on Mark's point there now. So I think uh, given the way uh, research is funded at universities, we do have uh, a moral duty and moral responsibility uh, to make our you know, data and our research findings uh, as, as open as we can, not, not just the academic community, uh, but more widely. I think, Mark, you mentioned in your talk, you know, the uh, you know, in, in the post-COVID world and concerns around trust and data, that, that we make sure that everything is actually available in a manner that's, that's usable, not just to academics, uh, but also to to non to non specialists, uh, and that's that's really the big motivator behind what we're what we're doing um, at, at Manchester. Um, and I think there are challenges around that too. You know, we we talk about uh, making various things open, but are we making them open in a way that actually does you know make sense and is interpretable by by the non specialist? And I I think that's a a really critical question. And I think we also have a a moral duty. Uh, you know, to make it interpretable as well to to non specialists, you know what we what we produce from from public funds. Um, if I can come in as well, we started open access to make, as Andrew says, the moral um, sharing of the outputs that are publicly funded. This is public money often that goes in to the research and making those available also to those who are the subjects of research, so they can see how they've contributed, etc. And that's increasing. And I think what's been great with the increasing focus on research culture, as we've seen um, from funding that's come from Research England and the growth of research culture statements and implementation plans at universities, is that going back round to why we started the open access movement in the first place and open research and the increasing sharing, um, both through um, participatory research as well, um, the growth of podcasts and things and events. So I think it's turning back round, but the way to measure that is through compliance, is through having those reports, et cetera. And they come hand in hand that when we're changing culture, we want to see how that's gone through and how successful we are with that. And the way to do that is have reports and compliance, which the funders uh, have asked us to do as part of the rep, et cetera. So I think it's not an either or, they come together. Staying with that uh, for just a minute, um, could you talk about how um, reliable open research infrastructure helps to ensure compliance with the, uh, the fair principles and open access policies uh, from funders and publishers? Maybe I can take that to start with and then obviously we'll hand over to whoever else wants to chip in. It's a really good point because uh, 
I was at a, a conference, um, another THE conference actually earlier uh, this year on digital transformation and how universities are having to manage the legacy of every department and every type of, uh, whether that's administrative department or research department, having bought their own software over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and universities are starting to map what that software is, how it inter interoperates with each other or doesn't. And, and a lot of things that appeared, there were spaghetti diagrams of, of systems all over the place. And it's really hard for a, an IT kind of governance strategy to make the universities and the research institutions able to plan and, and have, you know, definitely available solutions. So having repositories that are have a really good uptime the journal publishing workflow for a lot of researchers is there's a deadline for a, a special issue or a, a deadline for submitting a publication. And only at that point when they realize that they are having to share the data because that journal might be mandating that they, they have a DOI for data that's going to be plugged into a data availability statement. And if they are already down to the wire in submitting that publication and they go to the repository to submit data to get that DOI and it's down for maintenance, it's really going to be a not very good user experience from a software design point of view for that researcher. If, if you're going to provide a repository, it needs to be up. It needs to be available when they need it. It needs to have the features they're looking for. So I think some very basic things like just having repositories that don't have to go down for days or weeks for, for maintenance is actually quite important when we're talking about researchers that are dealing with often quite tight deadlines, either for publication or for funding applications as well. That's something I hear when I'm talking to to universities, but I will uh, hand it over to anyone else. If Can I just jump in? I think there's there's an important thing here with uh, the persistent identifiers for everything kind of notion. I think the way in which the dissemination of academic content was happening before, and that you have the the paper publication, which um, for whatever reasons is still the the unit of of publication, um, and it is still the context around the research. The idea was that that was the pathway into everything. And I think as we move into the space where people discover content in different ways, you know, we need to be very aware that people just go and Google things. Um, you need to meet the researchers where they are. So there needs to be the user experience that's compliant. And there also needs to be the uh, making sure that you're adhering to the terms of your grant, that you're adhering to the terms of your university when it comes to what we just heard about distributing research. And I think what's really interesting about this is it, it allows you to pull on information in different ways. So it used to be you'd have to go in through the paper DOI, whereas now you've kind of got a, a knowledge graph of information linked by these IDs. This ORCID, this research with this ORCID published these data sets with these DOIs and these uh, RAWs attached to them. And I think you then get things like the innovative side of things or the, the more useful side of things like uh, data site, which publishes the DOIs and uh, a, a knowledge uh, data site commons, which is a graph of all of the data set persistent identifiers across things like generalist repositories. Then you get this uh, kind of double-edged sword of, yes, we're making sure that we're uh, ticking the boxes when it comes to the moral obligations to making information openly available, but you're also creating new ways in which content can be um, discovered and interrogated, which I think is a lot of the principles behind FAIR. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, Claire, you mentioned digitalization um, and the momentum of digitalization in the higher education sector is building rapidly. And how does open research infrastructure relate to digitalization um, strategies at institutions? I will leave that open to the panel. I, can, I think this is very, thank you for asking that question because it's actually the point I didn't manage to get to when I was talking before. The, the main point is that software needs to have open APIs for me. That's that's really key. Um, so whether you're an open source based platform or a vendor based platform for repositories, uh, there's, I think there's no excuse to not have a completely open API. So APIs with any throttles or commercial limits or caps are, are really not in the spirit of the outputs being reused and shared a lot of the time within university systems. So I'm getting that back to universities and digital transformation. You're going to have so many systems where different kinds of outputs live, you know, looking at Claire's explanation of how many repositories uh, Leeds has, they need to eventually roll up into one kind of reporting mechanism or one kind of system, ideally, that's going to let them kind of have a view across all types of content, wherever that lives. And, and APIs are a really good way to be able to 
to do that. Um, so I think that's an important part to think of when we think about software and digital transformation for universities. I, I heard a university that will remain nameless uh, let me know that in their digital strategy they've published, uh, the the hope, the theory, is they're not going to approve any um, procurement of software that doesn't have an open API at their university in the UK. So I think we're going to start to see that be um, a, a good stick for vendor and you know, hosted open repository um, vendors to, to have to provide. Jean, just going to follow on to that. I think open yeah. standards are key because the data is going to live a lot longer than the software it's sat on. We need to migrate it. We need to know that it's going forward. One of the, the joys of working in a library is we're looking after things for generations and generations and how we do that, making sure we keep things safe. It's it's the bits and the data that we need to keep safe and the software and the people who look after it will change over time and how we do that in an easy way that we're not reinventing the wheel every time is really key and the standards and open APIs enable that. Yeah, if, if I could just follow up, and this also links to a question that's in the chat. I mean, there has been a proliferation of repositories over the last few years. Um, you know, what 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 does happen if you know one or several suddenly disappear? You know, so, you know these are run primarily on commercial grounds and. You know, it, it's a market, and and maybe not all will survive. So there, there is is there a risk that some will disappear? And if so, what happens then to, you know, those 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 you know outputs that have been hosted on, on that repository? I'm not, maybe, I'm not sure. Maybe I can come in again, having seen the comments in the chat about the proliferation of uh, repositories. Um, so I've been speaking very much from an institutional perspective here. All institutions in the UK are were expected by EPSERC. Um, to have an institutional repository to collect the data outputs of things that uh, um, did not fit into um, specialised subject-specific repositories. Uh, the idea is that these repositories are harvestable, um, that they are federated. So, for instance, the UCL repository is federated by various European systems, uh, including um, um, EUDAT, the EUDAT BT Find uh, service, which is part of EOSC. Um, it's very much built around fairness. These things are not isolated silos, and I don't think anybody is making the mistake of simply creating repositories to act as an isolated silo. Very important that it's part of this broader infrastructure around uh, Europe and indeed the world. Yeah, I think that's really important, that the concept that Reading a bit more specifically, um, one of that that comment about kind of EU uh, initiatives that are trying to maybe actually take some of the burden away from institutions having having to have their own repositories. Uh, this is uh, a very timely topic generally, but the the concept that there are one or two or three main systems, whether it's repositories or other systems, that uh, all universities should use, so they should stop doing things at institutional level. Um, you get very geographically centered in that being the new standard. So the concept that EOSC, which is a very EU centric, very EU heavy project should be the place that globally people really look to, to publish all their content or, or use it as the standards, um, doesn't really kind of take into account the global needs and the local needs of different countries, funders, countries, policies, you know, the different ways in people need to achieve their local missions and, and approaches. Um, so having the ability to have software that meets local needs, that has APIs or is interoperable so it can roll up into larger aggregators of discovery services is, is the way that we see that being sensible. There's there's ideology and how things could work. And it would be amazing if someone could get a UN style committee together to decide what one data sharing platform would be that meets all countries' needs. But I think that's, you know, not realistic and and we are doing what we can to meet local and uh global research needs through interoperable software. Yeah, they do They do it in China, there's ScienceDB. Um, and so there is an approach where, where that is happening. And I think uh, I, I counter that by saying, I think we need more repositories. I think that there's a gap here. You have super subject specific repositories like PDB that is changing the world, which is very well describes protein data. And then you have the generalist repositories like Zenodo or Fig, the free fig share. And what we don't have the, the institutional repositories are somewhere in the middle because they have curation. The next level up there is thematic repositories or subject specific repositories. And it's all about capturing the information and making it openly available. That it doesn't, as long as you are then 
what James said about federated in the sense there are open APIs, then you can pull together the data in different ways. It doesn't really matter where the data lives as long as it is ticking the boxes around uh, persistence, around openness, around um, making sure that the open APIs can be indexed in a way that uh, is fair. Um, we only have a few minutes left, left, unfortunately. So before we take questions from the audience, um, do you have any advice to share on best practice uh, for adopting open research repositories and also evaluating uh, their effectiveness? Um, I, I, I was just I really like the point I think Claire Turner you made about going where the academics are you know where where academics are actually engaged in practice and you know sort of you know rather than forcing everybody to use the same repository and do the same thing you know seeing what people actually use and then for those and those disciplines that aren't using those repositories come up with some very straightforward guidelines about how to engage I think that's what academics need you know we don't we don't read 19 page um, you know, papers. We want we want quick guides, and you know, we want to know how how this how this works and how it works in an efficient way for us, and fits within our workflows as well. Would anyone else uh, on the panel like to share their perspectives on this? I, I'm going to again praise Claire's slides, and I think the diagram she had of fair and what's that? So orchids. Um, um, persistent like the DOIs, et cetera. I think those sorts of things. It's looking at what are the key points that you need. If you're looking at repository to implement or to choose um, the community as well. We know things last when they have a community around them and people are building into it. If something hasn't had a deposit for 10 years, probably not where I'd put my data. <laughs> so it's just looking and talking to your network. Where do they go? Where do you look for things? When you're searching, where's the place you go and find the things you want to use? Therefore, that might be the place you want to do. So I think it is learning from those around you. And this is a very friendly sharing community. Never feel afraid to reach out to others because they will always, I find, give you really good examples and answers and tell you their experiences. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience um, here. Uh, Mark mentioned machine consumption of open access and machine cleaning and curation. For those of you working within a university setting, how much is this on your radar or for future plans? So I guess for everyone on the university on the call, how much are you thinking about whether or not the content you've got currently would, would be well fed into an AI, would it would it pick it up and make any sense of, of it? I think that's where the metadata, yes, the files, I think that was depends what the file types are and how easy that is to be come through. PDFs aren't necessarily easy to use and get information out and see that. So I think that's where our metadata is openly available, as we've discussed, it's open standards, et cetera, but it's the files. And I think that's where it very much comes down to how things are shared. I think going back to what James talked about, when things are in GitHub, when's the stamp, when do you know that's that version as well? So I think that's where it depends what type of content we've got in our repositories of how easy it can be used for OA, open access, AI, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of um, things that can be done to make data more interrogatable um, by um, AI and other sort of programmatic approaches. I think one of the things that we're starting to think about at the moment is the concept of fair digital objects. So in which um, the kind of the catalog record, as it were, is one source of that metadata, but it builds into that idea of metadata, not simply having a one moment of capture of a particular data set, um, but you can you build on all the things that have been created, but then you also link it to things in the future. So it's not something that remains a static thing, but something that continues to evolve. So the metadata you get from a repository such as Figshare is a very important part of that record, but it's part of a much broader uh, system whereby other people uh, can add metadata or add terms of use to version and all the other things that need to be done into the future. So it starts to go a little bit beyond um, what we're discussing here. But I think that in terms of machine, not just machine readability, but machine actionability, uh, that's going to be something that we all need to pay a lot more attention to in the future and being able to publish 
um, the kind of relationships uh, over the web. Thank you, James. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining. And thank you very much to our panelists for the amazing presentations and the insightful discussion. I would like to mention that we will share a post-event summary article and the recording of the webinar shortly to all the participants. Thank you and goodbye.